Good morning. Man, that is some fantastic music. It's, it's hard to follow that. We should uh, just all go home, I guess, after that. That's, man, that was fantastic. Thank you all so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Um, I've got some slides to go with what I want to talk about this morning. Um, again, my name is uh, Reverend Jacob Sims, and you saw my wife, Lindsay, and our three kids, Victoria and Christian. And I, let me say something really quick. She said that she had snacks for lunch yesterday. We don't always do that with our kids. We were, we were driving up yesterday, and we were just kind of trucking along and, and ate an early dinner. I just wanted to clarify, make sure that they, don't, they know that we don't just uh, inject our kids with snacks all the time. We actually feed them healthy things occasionally. It is a pleasure to be with you all this morning and to talk about, we also do really a couple of things, to talk to you about uh, something that our denomination, a new endeavor our denomination is embarking in, um, Brazil. Uh, missions in Salvador, Brazil. But I also really enjoy these opportunities to talk to churches because it, it gives me the opportunity to inspire churches to say, you know what, you're doing, you're doing awesome. God's doing some incredible things here. Just keep moving. Just keep trucking and allow God to continue to lead you. So we're going to look at a couple of verses to start off this morning. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so Salvador de Bahia is the next missions front of our denomination. And, and my family and I, and we will be the, the next missionaries for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And you know, it has, it's actually been quite a while since we've had a young American missionary family out in the field. It's probably been 15 to 17 years since we've had some in the field. Salvador, Brazil is indeed a new, completely new endeavor. Um, but I, what I want to talk about this morning, you know, why Salvador, Brazil? You know, why did y'all choose Salvador, Brazil? And it's not something we just plucked out of the air. It's part of this process of following God, and we'll get to that in just a second. But I want to start by reading some verses. It comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. It says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. How many of you understand and we, we don't just say it. We, we hear this phrase a lot, but how many of you truly have an understanding that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? How many of you truly and authentically believe that God has a plan and a purpose for this church's life, for our denomination, for the, the Christian church in America, for, for our global church? God is doing a new thing within the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. This is just one piece of it. God is constantly doing new things in our life, in our church. It, this, these verses, just a little bit of historical context here, these verses were, were written when the, the people of Israel, they were in exile. They were down and out. They were away from their precious Jerusalem, and they were, they were down. They thought it was all over. They thought, they thought God was done with them. And you can kind of get, it says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I say, what's going on? They were clinging to the exodus of the years that have passed. And they were saying, and they were trying to live off the spiritual capital that that exodus, that unbelievable supernatural event that happened in their life, they were clinging to that. They were away from their Jerusalem and they thought God was, was done they had lost hope. God is saying, I'm not done. I still have a plan and I still have a purpose for you. I'm already in the process of doing something new. Stop looking behind and let's look forward together. And let's move forward together. God still has a plan and a purpose. I've been to a lot of CP churches since we've been doing this whole deputation thing to get to the mission. And let me tell you, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are dying. Some of them, some of them are vibrant. Some of them are working hard right in the middle to, to progress. 
You know, really, the state of the church in general in the United States is, is in a transition time. It's trying to figure things out. But God is saying, I need you to follow me. I'm ready. We need to move forward. And something that fascinates me about our denomination is that as rich of a history as it has, and it's been around a long time, and I, I didn't grow up coming to Presbyterian, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, but, but I've been fascinated by the history of it. But one thing that really fascinates it about me, uh, what really fascinates me about the history of this is that as much as we've done, and as much as a lot of our churches and, and people in and around the denomination, they, they, they love that rich history, I have spent all of this time firmly believing that God isn't done. God is just beginning. He's already doing new things. Do we perceive it? Do we see it? Do we understand that God has a plan and a purpose for our life? He does. You can go to the next slide. You saw in the first one, of course, I meant uh, Salvador de Bahia. Bahia is the state. Salvador is, is the, one of the major cities in Brazil, and you saw that there. The Sims family's call to missions. You know, Lindsay and I have a very different call or kind of approach to this missions. She's been called to missions for quite a while, since 2003. Mine's been very progressive. As I said just a few minutes ago, if you would have said to me was as a kid or, or, as, or when I was in junior high or high school, you're going to be a missionary. I'm like, you're crazy. God's not going to do that. Of course, if you would have said to me when I was that age that you're going to be a pastor, I would have said you're crazy. God has a, a strange way of, of doing things in our life. When I was in seminary, I'll never forget. It's, I didn't even know the CP Church existed at that time, when I was in Birmingham, Alabama, at, at Samford University, at Beeston Divinity School, I was just a, a young guy and wanting to find a place to minister, to utilize all of this stuff that I was jamming my head with. And, and this little, tiny little Cumberland Presbyterian church came open, and, 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 and Lynn Thomas, who's actually my director now, he said, uh, I, I, we're looking for someone to preach there. Uh, someone gave me your name. Uh, I think you'd be a great fit. And I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not a Cumberland what is it, Cumberland Presbyterian? I'm not a Cumberland Presbyterian. And he said, well, what, what are you? I said, well, I'm really kind of non-denominational right now. We're not real sure. I grew up Southern Baptist. He said, oh, you'll be fine. So we started, we started ministering there. I, I, I didn't know what in the world I was doing, okay? This was a tiny little church, and, and the church is actually closed now. But they were precious there, and it gave us an opportunity uh, to, to preach and to minister uh, Lindsay started leading worship and such, and, but I'll never forget in this old sanctuary that had not been updated in, gosh, since probably the 80s, I was walking down the aisle in that sanctuary, and I said, God, what am I doing? I don't know what in the world I'm doing. Can I even prepare a sermon for every Sunday? I'm actually terrified to speak in front of people. What am I doing? And I, he, he said something to me that I will, I will never forget and it's something that is stuck with us and it's been with us even into this process and it's probably why we're embarking on the mission field any uh, why we're going to missions he says follow my lead follow my lead God wants to move forward he wants us to follow what does that look like Romans 12, 1 and 2, hopefully you can see all of that. This is the message version. I want us to look at this together. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your, ordin ord your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't come, become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. What is this for these verses saying? God wants us to be in order to do. God wants us to be passionate for him. 
and he wants us to be intimate with him in order that we may truly and authentically commit to his will for our life. God wants to move forward. And he's saying to all of your lives, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? Well, the funny thing about all of this is rarely do we ever see what's in front of us. What he's wanting us to see with that Hebrew word, yada, perceive means, is are you not aware of the, the plan, your possibilities, the purpose that I have for you as a person, as a church? I can't do that, God. I can't carry my family to Brazil. Just follow my lead. Following God moving forward into the new beginnings that he's already setting up in your life is not easy. It means that we must surrender. It's so easy to compartmentalize our life. Okay, well, there's, there's school, there's, there's work, and, and way over here, here's church. Here's my relationship with God. God wants God wants. His presence to be pervasive in all aspects of our life. He wants us to simply be in order that he may do through us. It means that we must look forward. Oh, this is a tough one. But what about the things that I've done? God can't use someone like me. But we haven't always done it like this. Look at all of the cool things we've done in the past. Follow my lead, he says, and move forward with me. We can't live on yesterday's capital, and we can't let yesterday's sins or uh, insecurities or whatever it cripple us. He wants us to move forward. It means that we must move away from complacency. This is a big one. We're creatures of habit. We love to do things the way we want them to be done. We love to assume a level of responsibility over our life, and we love to, 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 to get what we want when we want it. But God says, follow me. So how in the world, you can go to the next slide, how in the world did, did all of this come about? You can go to the next slide. We didn't just pluck Salvador out of the air. Our denomination didn't just pluck this place out of thin air. It's really been a process that, that, that God has been doing. Um, well, there used to be a picture of a church there. Anyway, you see the name up there. All right. After World War II, uh, Japanese immigrants were, were moving to Brazil and were farming. We have a, pres we have a Japan Presbytery, our, our denomination does. We have a presbytery in Japan. They started sending ministers over to Brazil, to this little area, uh, Monte de San Juan. They started sending ministers to that area. And over time, they started leading these people to Christ. And over time, they built this big, beautiful church. There, and there used to be a picture of it there. They built this big church and this beautiful guest house. And they were ministering to the, the, this place, Japanese immigrants that were in this area. Well, as time went on, some of the Japanese moved back to Japan. Some of them moved into the Salvador city, which is about two hours away. And the church slowly and progressively became more and more Brazilian. To, today, it's about 85 to 90 percent Brazilian. And the ministers came, were, began to talk to the Japan Presbyterian and said, We're, God's doing a new thing here. We need to start praying about this. Then they went to the missions ministry team of our denomination and said, God's doing a new thing. We need to follow his lead. He's doing something new here. God was ready to, to move away and start ministering to all of this, the, the Brazilians in this lower class community. So they got with the missions ministry team and representatives Milton Ortiz, Lynn Thomas went to, to Monte de San Juan in Brazil and started talking about what this would look like. The first thing they did is they called a Brazilian ministry. You can go to the next slide. I think maybe their pictures will show up, maybe not. Nope. Okay. Anyway, so they called a Brazilian minister to be to, to pastor this church in Monte de San Juan. 
And, and, but they said that the phase two, we, we really need to, to put a missionary in Salvador. That's where Brazilians are moving or to the cities. We need to place a Brazilian minister to minister to these people here, but we're, we need a young American missionary couple to be in Salvador, to plant churches in Salvador, to minister to not to, to the Japan, Japanese descendants, but also the Brazilians. Because Brazil is, is even though it's an evangelical nation, it's, it's drifting farther and farther and farther away from God. The Catholic Church has lost all grips on, on the people in Brazil. It's in desperate need of, authentic, of an authentic understanding of what it means to follow, of what it means to be a church member, what it means to give, what it means to be a community. They are losing that. So they started talking about this, and they said, well, who are you going to get to be the missionary in Salvador, Brazil? At the very same time as these conversations were happening, my wife and I were having conversations in Piedmont, Alabama, where I was pastoring a church in Piedmont, Alabama. It's, it's just east of Gadsden, Alabama. And we started feeling this, this tugging in our heart. We're really confused about it. I was perfectly comfortable with being a pastor. I'd gone to seminary. I was getting my feet wet. I had by no means perfected what it meant to be a pastor. But I was getting comfortable, and I was fine with it. But God was doing something. So we started praying about it. We started spending time with God and talking to God about it. And we both knew God was calling us to missions, but we didn't know where. So in the comfort of our home, we, we committed to be missionaries, to go wherever. That wasn't easy. And it only got harder from that point. So we started praying about where to go and I send, you know, and, and Lynn posts some pictures of this, this beautiful Brazilian countryside. And I didn't even know we had anything going on in Brazil. So he posts pictures about it. And I send him randomly a message about, wow, that's really beautiful. And I was really sending him a message because, Lynn, I want to sit down. I need to talk with you about something. Lynn has been my mentor. It's, it's who I kind of talk to about things and I, that God is doing in our life. As soon as those, those Japanese elders ask Lynn, who are you going to get to be the missionaries in Salvador, Brazil? This social media message vibrates on Lynn's phone. And, and there's Jacob Sims. It says, wow, Brazil is very beautiful. I didn't know we had anything going on. Oh, by the way, Lynn, I really need to sit down and I need to talk to you about something that the Lord has done in our life. And Lynn says to those elders, he says, I think I just found your missionaries. When we follow God, we never have complete clarity. And we're not supposed to. That's the essence of following, of submitting. He wants to lead us in triumphal possession. He wants, in order that we may be able to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him, we have to submit and follow. And sometimes that means we don't always know where we're going to go, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, or, or anything. It just means that we have to follow. And from that moment forward, we had a peace about Salvador, Brazil. And we said, God, as long as you continue to open doors, we'll go. So it came time. I talked to the church about it. And it, it, it came time, and, and, and we felt like God was saying, we need you to move from Piedmont. We didn't know where we were going to move. We didn't know where we were going to go. We didn't have a place to live. I didn't know how I was going to make any money. But God says, we think you need to move in August of this year. The church thought I was crazy because <laughs> they wanted us to stay. But... And mostly they didn't want us to be without. We said, we need to go. God will provide. You know, when we choose to follow and surrender ourselves to him, we don't always know. He just wants us to trust. He, he wants the fragrance of the knowledge of him spread so that new songs are consistently sung, not just in Goodlettsville, Tennessee, or Nashville, or the state of Tennessee, or Birmingham, Alabama, but everywhere in the world. So it talks about in Acts 1.8. We are the way he does that. But he needs us to follow. I use the illustration a lot. All of us have seen the movie, the Disney movie Aladdin, right? Where they're standing on the balcony, you know, and, and Aladdin is, well, he's, he's not Aladdin at the moment. He's got the disguise, I think. And, and he's on the magic carpet, and she finds out, he's, wow, 
you've got this really cool magic carpet. And he flies up and, he, and, and he's going to take her for the magic carpet ride. Then they have that whole, that beautiful song that we probably all know the words to. What does he ask her when he reaches his hand down? Do you trust me? That's right. Thank you. You're the first person that's ever answered that out loud. Thank you. He says, he asked Jasmine, do you trust me? Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good movie. Essentially, that is the essence of following God. We be in order to do, but there's this, there's this level of trust. It doesn't just happen automatically. We are passionate for God, intimate with God, so that we can authentically commit and do. But, but there's one thing that we must understand. We have to trust he wants to take us on that magic carpet ride. That's the whole that, that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 14, the triumphal procession. That's how the knowledge or the fragrance of the knowledge of him is spread everywhere. That's how new songs are sung is when he is flying us on his carpet, flying us and leading us in this unbelievable journey. But he's asking us, he's asking you, do you trust me? God wants to see new songs sung. But it'll never happen if we divorce ourselves from, divorce our decisions from our prayer time and intimacy with God. We must understand that God is already doing a new thing. Do you see your possibilities? Do you see the plan and purpose God has for your life, for this church's life? We saw it. And we grabbed the hand and we got on the carpet ride. It hasn't been easy. And we're scared to death. We just finished the visas. The Lord provided a place for us to live. We have to learn a language. We'll be by ourselves, and we have no clue what we're doing. And here I am again on that aisle. I don't have a clue what I'm doing, God. And he's just saying, follow my lead. That may be doing something that you never thought you would do in your school. Quitting a job and doing something you never thought that you would be doing. It may be committing your life to ministry. It may be committing your life to missions. And who knows what it is? But God has a plan. And he has a purpose. And he's saying, do you trust me? We hope to be there this December. And one thing I love about our denomination is that we're a connectional church. Me and Lindsay and our family may be the ones going, but, but you guys are going too. So I always ask the church, how are you praying for missions? How are you giving to missions? And how are you partnering with missions? Go. Do. It'll open your eyes to, to God's love and mercy and grace in ways you've never seen it before. We need your prayer. Our kids need your prayer. And missions and just and seeing God do and the, the, the people that were just talking about Louisiana, when, you know why they're emotional? They're emotional because they saw God's love. They saw God moving in a way that you don't always get to see. God never leaves us, forsakes us. He's with us and he wants to lead us and guide us and direct us. And all he's saying is he's saying, do you trust me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this church. Thank you, Lord, for the new things that you are already doing in the lives of everyone that is here. There may be missionaries sitting in this congregation. There may be future ministers, pastors, evangelists, whatever, sitting in this congregation. There may be young people that's about to do 
to, be, to boldly make changes in their school because they're passionately in love with you, God. I pray that we follow you, that we trust you, and that we don't ever look back, but we keep moving forward with you, Lord. I love you, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. William Carey says, expect, attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. What this church is attempting, bless them, God, and do things in this community, in the lives of the people that are here, Lord. We love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Sometimes. Yeah, go ahead. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> sometimes as a pastor, you get privy to understanding how people think. And sometimes you realize that that thinking is incorrect when it comes to how it lines up with the Bible. I discovered that about five and a half years ago when we started talking about mission work in South Africa. And I noticed several, and logic seems to say, hey, there's a plenty to do around here, and there is. And I understand that. And so I don't assume that it's a problem with the person who has the wrong understanding. I assume that I haven't done my job in teaching it. And so one of the things that I want to make sure is extremely clear that the Great Commission starts in Jerusalem, but it doesn't end there. And he doesn't say, wait till everybody in Jerusalem is saved and every child's fed before you go to Judea. Amen. And he doesn't say, wait till Judea is all taken care of before you go to Samaria. Hmm. And the same thing with the other most parts of the world. Paul was in the farthest most part of the world and there were still people who were unsaved in Jerusalem. But if he would not have gone, we would not have been here today. And so... We absolutely will do our best to not neglect the need right here in Goodlettsville. Amen? Amen? And we're not going to neglect the need in the surrounding areas. But we're also not going to, make sh to neglect the need in Brazil when we as a church have somebody that's going there to spread the gospel. And so here's how we help. Number one, you need to be praying. Could the Lord be calling me to go? Maybe Brazil, maybe somewhere else. Could there be a call on your life to possibly be a missionary? Well, I'm going to tell you, there's a call on all of our lives to be a missionary. It's just a matter of where. My daughter, my cute little 15-year-old daughter, wants to be a missionary. And I'm going to tell you this. I'd much rather her go to China and honor God than to stay here and be out of his will. Amen. And so... We either go or we send. And so I am really thankful that God is doing something new in our denomination, aren't you? I'm extremely excited about that. What a great, incredible nation Brazil is. We got to watch it in the World Cup and the Olympics and beautiful people. And won't it be awesome to see a renewal of God's spirit and people coming to faith in Christ? We sometimes, golly, in this election that we're going through, Everybody's accused of everything. Everybody's accused of being uh, sexist and racist and everything else. But sometimes, honestly, we only think about ourselves. And God loves those people in Brazil as much as he loves the people here in Tennessee. And so we have the opportunity to go. We have the opportunity to send. Those envelopes, where are those, Jacob? I'm going to ask you guys here in a moment... They're, they're uh, underneath the TV out there. There's information about the couple, so you can take that and pray for them and their family. And there's also envelopes if you'd like to pray about how you can support financially. Those are on the table underneath the TV in the foyer. Absolutely. And then if you want to do it through our church, we have a missions committee called the Over and Above, which means above our giving, our normal giving, over and above as God blesses, as he leads, we have the opportunity to give directly to these guys through our committee. And we will collect that, and we will send that. And if that's something you say, I can do $20 a month, that'll help. And so just think about the impact that we can make through Jacob and Lindsay and their family. And so it's been a blessing to have you guys with us Amen. today. They're going to be with you guys in a challenger class today. Challengers, raise your hand. Yeah. Good luck on that, Jacob and Lindsay. <laughs>
And uh, Challenger class, I'd like for you, please, to gather around them, put your hands upon them gently, and pray for them today before your class is over. Will you do that? Would you stand? And if you'd like to make a if you'd like to make a commitment to the Lord, if you need this altar for prayer, if you'd like to join our church in our mission, Daniel's going to lead us as we sing, and uh, you feel free to come.